thank you everybody for joining us today. We hope you are having an amazing day. And um, so my name is Paul Adepoju, and I'm the community manager uh, for the International Center for Journalists, Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. If you were with us last week uh, when we officially started uh, this series of webinars on, empire, on empowering the truth, uh, you would agree with me that it has been uh, a really, really amazing session. And I just want to thank everybody that started this journey with us. And um, hopefully today is also okay. Hopefully today is also another amazing session uh, for everybody. We'd like to know where you're joining us from. So please use the chat box to tell us your name and your location and um, what you are looking forward to enjoying me to enjoy today. And um, thank you very much. And uh, please, in addition to the name, let us know your location. And hopefully you know that um, as these sessions are ongoing, we would really, really love uh, to really know uh, every a lot about you. So let's quickly have a quick poll to express to know where you are joining us from. So a screen has popped up, uh, a slide has popped up. There's a poll on your screen right now. Please answer the questions, just four questions in all. That tells us um, that enables us to have insight regarding uh, where you are joining us from. We would like as many people as possible to view this question and do this, answer these very four simple questions before we get this show running. I also want to thank uh, everyone that is joining us on Facebook, uh, that is going on Facebook right now. Thank you on IGNet platform. And um, very soon on the International Center on our forum, on our forum's uh, Facebook page too. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. We are glad that you could also um, be part of everything that we are doing today. And I, like I said, I really, really want to know as much as possible where a lot of you are joining us from today. We've gotten 38% of participants that have participated in this uh, in this quick poll. Please and please um, let's get you, let's get this going. Our, Trainer to is already here, and I would like her to start as soon as possible. But we'd like to cross the fifty percent uh, participation uh, regarding this quick poll before we start that, and I think it is going to go a long way in helping guiding her if she desires to localize some aspects of her presentation, and um some in house. Um, rules. Um, we welcome questions and please use the Q&A platform uh, on the Zoom, uh, Q &A, Q &A section on the Zoom platform to put your questions. That is the first option. And the second option, which I really, really like, is you actually raise your hand uh, to actually ask your questions live. We welcome contributions, we welcome suggestions. So please and please, if you would like to ask some questions live, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and be part of it. We are pushing 50% of participants that have asked answer these questions and uh, we would really, really be glad for more people to, uh, to answer our questions. So please and please, uh, a few more people, we just need a few more people to answer these questions and uh, we'll be ready. So let me introduce our trainer today, Miss Hannah Ucho. How are you doing, Miss Hannah? Thank you for joining us once again. We are glad to have you. How are you today? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here again to talk to the audience, people, I can see from the chat, you know, people from Kenya, Tanzania, Pakistan, everywhere that you guys are joining from. Thank you for making out the time to join this discussion today. And I'm quite glad to be here to lead this session. And I hope we get to learn a lot from each other. 
Yes, with that done, thank you. We had 57%. Please, people, let's get it to 60%, and I will let us start <laughs> the training. While doing that, uh, Ms. Hannah, you can start sharing your screen, and I think we are heading yes. towards that 60%. I think that's going to, it's going to coincide with when your screen gets starts sharing. And uh, please feel free, we want to make this as interactive as possible and as engaging as possible. If you are still join, just joining us, there is a poll on the that is on your screen. Please answer that poll, uh, participate to where you are joining us from. So, Ms. Hannah, you have the floor. Okay, hello, everyone. Hello once again. So, thank you so much for joining this program, this webinar today. And like you all were informed, we'll be talking about reaching critical audiences. So how do you reach critical audience, especially in this time where the trust level for news is declining, where people do not trust media associations to get factual information, where they would rather look to social media or look to their influencers to get news and information and we know that you know in some countries around the world there are critical elections happening in 2024 and we as fact checkers one of the roles that we play is to set the agenda for credible information so that people are able to make informed decisions about issues relating to government or issues relating to health or other important life issues. And there has been studies that has kind of established how consumption pattern of information increases polarization, especially in the US. And I know it's the same for like, it's almost the same for other part of the world. And I know we all as journalists are grappling with different challenges. And one of the core challenges, how do we want to reach critical audiences? and a part of these critical audiences can be young people. In most cases, it's usually young people who uh, kind of who have issues trusting the news and who do not get their news from the traditional trusted news institutions. And also, we can also talk about maybe older audiences who are underserved, maybe those who don't get their news in English or do not have access to like what I'll refer to as some of the premium reporting content. So we'll be doing that today. And to start, first, I'd like to say that I would like this to be like an interactive session. I, you can, you are free to like put your comments in the chat box. I'll try to follow that as much as possible. And I know if there's anything, like Paul can always call my attention. So we'll have like some presentations and then maybe later we can take a break for coffee or tea so you can just get hydrated. And then we'll have some be question and answer session and then the final thing, which will be like you doing like sharing like a little idea of how, of the things you need to do to get your news to reach critical audiences. So I'm starting on those notes with an introduction to an election disinformation project that my organization, Fact Matter, did during the election in Nigeria. And the aim of the project was to, you know, restore information integrity on digital platforms, combat disinformation about the elections, and reach younger audiences with fact-checking content. So it's the Fact Matter Election Disinformation Project. And it was funded and supported by the National Endowment for Democracy and also the International Center for Journalists. That was like, it was actually a project that I did as an ICFG fellow. And these are the partners that we work with, Africa Czech, the Cable, Dubawa, Check Hub, Center for Democracy and Development. These are news organizations in Nigeria. I know last 
week we had last two weeks or oh, last week we had like our trainer Laura will talk about building network and reaching for collaborations. So that was for me collaboration was a critical part of our project because we do not want to duplicate what other people were doing. We wanted to enhance what this fact checking organization we're doing and we are working to see how we can get their fact checking content to get more eyeballs by using different digital formats that young people can relate with. Okay, so one of the ways that we tried to reach people with fact checking content and media literacy content was to try to use humor. We believe making your content accessible is important. So, and we keyed into the growing popularity of short comedy videos among social media users. And this is a point out of the fact that when you want to reach audiences, you know, it's quite the demographic, the demography may be different in your region, but also that is why you need to look at where young people or older people, how are they consuming their content? What sort of content do they usually engage with? And for us, we discover there is a growing market for influence marketing or content creators. And there's this short comedy video trend, which is quite popular on Nigeria's social media platform. So we keyed into that concept by designing some of our media literacy content in a comedy format, working with social media influencers to kind of sensitize their followers on why they need to verify information before they share. And one of the things that we did to get more eyeballs to some of our video content or the content of our media partners was to work, was to ask us influencers to share some of this content on their media platforms. I know like in Nigeria, many of these influencers have more followers than the fact checking organizations that we work with. So that means they are able to reach more people than some of the media platforms. And this is one that we did with a medical influencer. And the other one on the side was a video debunking a claim that we will work on with a, an influencer who, who produces content in Hausa language. Hausa language is one of the main languages in Nigeria. So this also speaks to the need to kind of key into, let's say if you are in a non-English context, or maybe you work in a country or you are serving in a region where you have other languages than English, you can also, you should also consider those communities because most times those people are left out and they are underserved by the mainstream media. So one of the other things that we that we did when we tried to reach our audiences was to work with some of the fact checking partners to turn their fact checking content into short videos. It's a fast paced world. People are getting a lot of information, and most times they may not really enjoy just reading through or scrolling through their forms and taking the time to read long information or long news pieces. So some of those reports, we, we work it into short videos, you know, one minute videos, 30 seconds videos, or sometimes one and 30 minute videos. So people who usually are not able to read can just quickly watch the video and they are able to gets credible information in that manner. And for the videos, one of the two that we use, okay, that was an example. So one of the, the, the major two that we use for our video production was, or is an app called Lumen5. 
So I just, I'm just gonna, I want to type the name Zuman5. So in case you want to look it up later. And it uses AI to repurpose content. So you can have like a text to, you can have like a text to photo, a text, it has a text to video format. And you also have like an opportunity to upload like your talking head and create talking head videos. And now I think they've added another feature where you can also add voiceover or you had your text and it generates like a voice for, for you. So it's generates a voice over that you can use in your video. And I would like to, the reason why I'm emphasizing those two is the fact that it is quite easy to use. I know for some people who are familiar with my work, you know, I have led training on how to use Lumen 5 or just demonstrate how you can easily use it. Anyone can jump on it. You can learn how to use it. It's quite easy to use and you don't need to have like a video edit editing experience. So that makes it easy if you are running, running a lean newsroom or you have limited ants or limited resources. So Lumen 5 is something that I recommend. And it's the major tool that we use in producing social media videos for our media partners so they can share with readers on their platforms. And one of the other things that we did, you know, in trying to reach new audiences with fact checking content is we also tried to do, like we tried to do like an in-person workshop for journalists just to train them on how they can detect manipulated or synthetic media. You know, the Nigerian election witness, like we have cases of generative AI and we thought it was important to, to kind of train journalists on how they can detect disinformation created with generative AI. I, I will not dwell much on this. I think, yes, the other thing that I want to dwell on is how we were creating conversations on social media platforms, especially using Twitter space to get people to talk about some of the issues affecting disinformation and the election. And one thing that I noticed with some of our Twitter spaces is that usually when we host the space, we are able to get more followers you get people who don't usually engage with fact-checking content. They are curious, you know, they want to know, they want to learn. So that was something that we did that work. And curating conversations is very important, especially at a stage where you have like where the tech, where tech companies are trying to, should I say, take over the works of journalists, you know, with generative AI, and then the the limitations like with Google trying to kind of limit how people can access like media content through search engines, you know, just trying to summarize everything using AI. So it's quite important that like one of my colleagues said that, you know, we should be looking at creating conversations and, you know, we are not, we are no longer like the only gatekeepers in this profession. So we need to start looking at creating conversations so that we are leading the agenda for what people should be deliberating in. And those spaces, like the Twitter spaces or X as it's now known, provided an opportunity for us to kind of engage with our followers, our audience, you know, they could hear the voices of the people that are in charge of the content that has been shared. And I think this helps to build trust. So if you're thinking of gaining trust or reaching more audiences, you definitely should be looking at events, maybe virtual events. If you're not able to do like an in-person event, virtual events like Twitter spaces could be very useful. You could do maybe like one in a month, depending on your capacity. And some other people do like Instagram live and the rest just looking for creative ways to also engage your audience apart from 
publishing articles or posting videos. So the impact of our projects, it was like a year long project. And like I said, it's tried to kind of reach like a critical audience with election information, credible information about the election. So we had millions of organic engagements because at that time we could not even promote some of our content on platforms like Facebook. You know, Facebook was not allowing for political adverts and the rest, but the formats that we use kind of help us to reach people organically. And one of the formats that was very great for that was very great in doing that was, you know, the idea of working with influencers. When our influencers post media literacy videos, or sometimes when we get them to reshare some of the content, some of the fact checking content. If you read through the list of comments, you see like people are able to engage more with that content, to share their views, to share their opinion. And to some extent, I can say like they are able to kind of believe this content. So the organic engagement that we got for our media content was like due to the media strategy that we use and also the collaboration that we built with social media influencers. So we had behavior change testimonies, like people talking about how the information helped them, like, oh, I didn't know this. Thank you for sharing this. So, and, you know, basically appreciating the efforts and talking about the things they would do next, how they would use the information. Because I've always believed that one of the functional or the important core of journalism should be to provide people with the information that they can use to make informed decisions. You know, we always say like actionable information. So we were able to achieve this and our project has been featured in platforms, international platforms, you know, just to share the examples of what we did. Yeah, so I think this is like the, the end of the, the introduction, I'll call this the introduction aspect before we go into like the main slides that we have. So I don't know if we have, if anyone has any, if you have any question regarding like what I just shared, please feel free to ask. Yes, I think um, maybe question or comment. Somebody retreated the setting agenda aspect of what you aim to achieve. Miriam is asking um, the video editing app. I think that is Lumen Five, mm -hmm. which was what you said. Um, yes, Idris, would you like to ask a question live? Let me see. Idris. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for this uh, initiative. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask Hannah whether part of the media engagement that you were able to have, which featured your work uh, including platforms such as BBC, AFP, and what have you, what was the mechanism that you used to achieve that feat? Thank you. Okay, so if I get your question correctly, you want to know like the mechanism that we use to get featured in like some of those media platforms that you mentioned. So basically we did not set out to be featured by some of those media platforms. We were just doing our work and they noticed like the unique approach that we use, especially like the aspect of using humor to communicate media literacy content. So let's say we are trying to teach people why they should verify their information. We ask our influencers to help us create content that uses comedy so that they can reach more people. So it was basically how we approach our work, the use of influencers, which we started doing way back in 2020 when the project started. Then our project was focused on COVID-19 disinformation. 
and we started working with social media influencers to debunk COVID-19 disinformation. And during the election reporting projects, we also adopted the same format. So those were the unique aspects of the projects that stood out and that got us featured in interviews in some of those platforms. So I hope I was able to answer your question. And yes, I think I think you did well. Yes, and I actually want to share like a video, like one of the videos that we created with a content producer. So I'll I'll go back to do just that. So I hope you guys can see my Twitter screen. Yes. Hiring? Aren't you tired of hoping for the right candidate to your job post and apply? It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. That's why you should try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com. Yes, shh, shh. I know what you're about to do. Forwarded to all contacts. <laughs> Did you verify the source? Did you fact check? 5G causes COVID. Yves Rulea, Viam. Best in clearing and forwarding. No! Same way you forwarded drink and bit with salt to prevent Ebola. You use Same you, COVID vaccine is 666. Viam. Grand peddler of fake news. Do you know how many people died from hypertensive complications alone because of your salt crusade? Definitely more than the 20 confirmed cases of the 2014 Nigerian Ebola outbreak. That is the consequence of fake news. Mm. Information Minister, did you know that another virus deadlier than COVID-19 pandemic is looming? Oh, not be me talk more. Now the WHO talk down on. Verified, my brother, my sister. As much as it's important to stay informed, false information does more harm than you can imagine. It's bad enough that a lot of crazy things are happening in our health sector, politics, and even the economy. Don't add an extra layer of suffering to what is already on ground just because it feels convenient to share that false information. Before you share, have you considered asking some basic questions like, does the news item seem reasonable? Is the source reliable? When was this information published? You can also head over to Facts Matter NG to learn some basic verification tips and even clarify if an information is legit or or not. Diseases pandemics are bad enough. Don't add fake news pandemic to the equation. That being said, please stay safe and stay out of trouble. Okay, so that was like an example of that we did. We had other ones trying to tell people to be mindful of disinformation generated by artificial intelligence, and we actually did that in one of the local languages, Alsa language. Okay, someone is asking for the link of the video. Yes, I'm happy to share that. And if you go to our website, www.factmatterng.com, you can see some of the videos that we did during that period. So let me quickly share the link to that video before I proceed. Okay, and I think, uh, and there are some questions in the Q and A box. So I'm just going I'm, to run I'm thinking, that. What do okay. you think? I'm thinking since we still have other presentation that we should take all the questions together okay. at the end. Okay. okay. I think that's what I think. So let's go to the other presentation. Then we have that extensive question and answer session. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so before we go to the other presentation, I just want to maybe you can just quickly type your response in the chat. I was supposed to do a poll, but somehow time was not my friend. So in what primary formats do you publish for the people here? Like how do you publish your news item? Do you basically do you publish on the websites? Do people assess your information on the websites? Do you publish primarily in videos or TV or prints? If you can just if I can just quickly have your maybe just respond some few responses. Okay, so web and audio.
web. Okay, web. Okay, thank you for the responses. Websites, web, web TV. Okay, print and radio. So I have, I can say that majority published through like the websites, trains, radio. So that'll be like the website, like is the majority. Is the majority option here website website okay podcast that's fine mm -hmm. yeah and i agree with kandani that pod, 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 podcast can have value because it is very important at the moment many people are consuming information through audio even for me most times i'm doing other things i'm listening to a podcast is one of the ways through which I consume news information. So now let's go to the main presentation for the day, which is about reaching critical audiences. And I'll start to share my screen again. And if maybe through the course of the presentation, if you need clarity on anything, you can post the call, you can just let us know. I'm sure Paul will be on the lookout and can bring me back if I'm either running too fast or if I need to, to clarify some things. I hope you get, you all can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Okay, so. So this is like a part of the session where we get to talk about, you know, look at how we can reach audiences online. So, so introduction, I think I've done a little bit of introduction when I started with the previous slides when I shared information or I shared like some relevant key notes about the election disinformation projects that my organization did. And now I wanna talk about reaching critical audiences and many of the resources or a major part of the resources for this session was from the Financial Times Next Gen reports next generation report. I don't know if anyone has, if most of you have seen that report, it was published recently about how people would be assessing news in 2030. So talking about younger audiences and their news experience. So we'll talk about news audience trends. What are the emerging news audience trends? Because this research was conducted among young people in, in Nigeria, in mm -hmm. India, in the US, and in the UK. So you have like the global north and the global south. So the research caters to the news pattern of like different regions. And one could see like similarities. You know, we say that with technology, the world is a global village. So there are similar patterns when it comes to news consumption for for young people and the report is basically challenging us to think of how we are creating content for this critical aspect of the society who are being left behind by major news publications. And we can talk about new audience opportunity, case studies, and then we have the final tips and takeaways. Okay, so before I go on, I think the next thing I want to do is to is to play the video, which kind of summarizes like the finding that I, about the next generation reports on reaching out to on reaching younger audiences. So let me stop this and 
for sharing my screen. Just give me a second. I'll start by sharing my screen. So I hope you guys can see my screen. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm going to play the next generation news. Oh. I enjoy reading news, I enjoy staying. I enjoy reading news, I enjoy staying up to date. I don't like feeling like I don't know what's going on in the world. Probably use Instagram the most. I engage with the news mostly, if not all the time, on my phone. I consume a lot of video content. I would rather watch a YouTube video for three minutes than read an article for a minute. Mostly TikTok first and then Instagram. We wanted to better understand what the future of news consumption looks like in 2030. Through understanding these insights about young news consumers and using them as a way to predict the behavior of more news consumers in the next five to seven years, we will enable publishers to be able to see their opportunities differently. If we study young news consumers, we will have a lens into what most news consumers will be doing in five to 10 years. We spoke to young people between the ages of 18 to 24. We also wanted to make sure that the research wasn't just based on US perspectives. And so we partnered with two research firms, one in Nigeria and one in India. We uh, learned from a combination of people in urban settings, in more rural settings and suburban settings. A lot of the research identified needs of the next generation that are not sufficiently being met by the news industry of today. We explain this gap through the lens of the ideal news experience. Firstly, young people want news from sources that they trust and have a personal affinity with. Most of the information I get from TikTok is directly from a certain specific person. It's direct from the source as much as it, as much as it can be. Young people want news that is personally significant to them and their communities. I love to stay updated on topics that I like, like really in depth. After I go through the headlines and I'll go to the YouTube channel, I'll go on Instagram, maybe do a manual search and read more about it. Young people want news and storytelling formats that are engaging and fit with their online lives with language, summaries, and videos that speak to them. So they should find a way to make the news interesting. It should be easily understandable to all age groups. Let us face what is actually happening now. Bring it out in a way that will be enticing for us to actually read it or follow your opinions. It's really important. News continues to be not only relevant, um, but also that it connects with people and helps them to shape their understanding of what's happening in the world. I think not knowing what's going on in the world is really bad. The engagement of the public with media is, is a crucial part of society and a functioning democratic system. If I want to form an opinion about something, which I think is really important, if you want to live today's world, you can't ignore the news. Okay, so that was it. I hope maybe some of the things, some things stood out for you in that clip. If you are listening attentively, you can hear, you know, you're hearing Instagram, TikTok and everything. Yes, and thank you for the emojis. <laughs> Keep it coming. Yeah, I kind of acknowledge them. So Yes, yeah, so the clip is available online. I would actually share the website. At the end of this presentation, you have like even for the report for you to engage with. Like if you are really serious about reaching new audiences, I highly recommend that report. And let me quickly share link to, to that video in the chat box before I 
if I go back to my slides. Yep, so I've shared the link. You can engage with it later. And I agree, like Antonio said, that like you have great insights from, from the video, which is quite useful for people who are thinking about how to reach younger audiences and get people to engage more with the news. So I'll go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so I've started with the introduction. I'm trying to be mindful of time here so that we have enough time to take questions. So news feeds and preferences of the next generation. I believe one of the key demographic that is critical in the new dynamics are young people. Everywhere in the world, the news experience for young people is quite different. Even from now and thinking ahead of the future, you know, the population that usually depend for on the legacy media or the legacy media format of television or radio is declining. Many people are having access to to the internet and you even find older people consuming news in the same format that young people would consume news, you know, maybe through WhatsApp or through Facebook and the rest. And with what some of the study established and even with some of the, what I can gauge from like the short question that I asked is that there is a gap between the news experience that the next generation wants and what they are for being served with. Many of the media platforms are still producing content through, you know, website, or TV, radio. So like there's a need for, there's still a gap that needs to be filled up. And I hope we'll be able to get some insights on how to do that. So to fill this gap, there's a need to kind of have an understanding of news consumption patterns, like who is your audience? Where are they getting their news from? I don't know if any of us, if you're familiar with the concept of design thinking. So it's something that you can go research, maybe just keep make a note to drill deeper, like design thinking for news. So how, when you approach your news distribution from the fact that you are selling a product and how do you want people to engage with those products? And you're even starting from the line of thought that, okay, so who am I selling this product to? Are you sure you are serving them the way they want to engage with the products? Because most times we have our, our style, we have the ways or the traditional way that we've been doing our reporting and we just assume We've been doing this this way. This is how people should engage with this content. But times are different. News consumption pattern is changing. And one way to find out what your audience wants is to adopt a design thinking experience. And one of the ways you can do that is through needs finding. So you are talking to them. You want to hear back from them. You're engaging them in the news process so that you want to know what their consumption pattern is like. How can you serve them? In what, for, in what format would they like to engage with content? What time of the day do they want to get the content? What are the topics that, are, that appeals to them? So these are some of the needs finding aspects. And I would recommend maybe for some of us, maybe you have to, we have to do that constantly. If it's been a long time that you've kind of heard from the audience that you are serving, just can do research questionnaires, interviews, and just hear about what is the news, what is their news experience like? What are the things that, what are the new ways or new formats that they will prefer to engage with content? So this is very important. So, and this brings me to one of the insights from the report, which is, which talks about 
the emerging audience trends. So you have four audience trends. You have digital simultaxing, which is different from multitaxing. So, and this relates to the fact that these days, young news users would usually transition between different tags while on their phone. So it's different from multitaxing. You know, multitaxing, maybe you are doing two things at a time, but for digital summer taxing, you're talking about you know, trans transitioning between unrelated tags. So maybe they are listening to the news, they are talking to someone on WhatsApp, on WhatsApp or they are checking like an e-commerce app or trying to buy something on Amazon or doing different things at the same time. So when you have the strength, it's also, it also informs how you are thinking of packaging your content. So you're thinking, oh, if I put, if I publish mainly using my website and I'm trying to reach like a 22 or a 24 year old, how, and I know that usually this 22 year old would usually transition between tags like, the, it's not quite often that it will sit down to engage with the content. So are you thinking of, oh, maybe I need to do video. Maybe I need to do podcasts so that while they are listening to the podcast, they're able to do other things. So these are some of the ways that we should be thinking of packaging our news. So the other audience trend, the second one is sense making through digital discourse. And this relates to this pattern of people, young people, of course, and even older people, maybe, you know, when we talk about young people who want to think about Gen Z or Gen X, but I know even millennials will rely a lot on opinion of others to frame and understand the news. And that is why you have people like, you know, Piers Morgan, and I know even in the US, you have like a lot of independent journalists who kind of try to shape opinion. They provide like news analysis. They have YouTube channels. You know, YouTube like, YouTube is a great place for, for news these days, a, a great place for kind of setting agenda and forming opinion. And thus independent journalists or even social media influencers or just regular people you know, they kind of help their followers to, to frame and understand the news. So a lot of young people want to make sense of the news through digital discourse. It's not like the former tradition where people are waiting to read the editorials from newspapers, or they are waiting to read analysis on CNN or BBC or from a local respected journalist. These days you have people who take on that role. They upload their content on YouTube, you know, they talk and analyze the news from their own perspective. So that is one of the audience trends that is a thing in this period and that people who are trying to reach younger audiences should be thinking about. And the other thing is, the other trend is the filter through trusted network. So seeking out information from people that they know, and these are influencers and content creators. You know, at the time when, should I say the time of the digital invasion, then journalists were complaining about citizen journalists doing the job and maybe not following some ethical guidelines. But now we've moved from citizen journalists to influencers and content creators who are shaping the news agenda. And most times these influencers, they even get, you know, they get patronized by politicians, by industries. So that is a key sector in the news ecosystem. They are people that you can't ignore because many people are getting their news and information from influencers because they follow them and they trust them. And again, the new trend, sophisticated, the other audience trend is sophisticated searching. So this means you know, the next generation news users or young people 
are able to search. They have sophisticated search skills on social media platforms and their online communities that they built to help them manage information overload. So let's say they type something on Google. I know Google would give you different options. So they can maybe just go to Reddit or go to some of those platforms. Like in Nigeria, I think you have Naira Land, you know, some, some of these communities where some of these topics can be discussed in, in depth. So they are not really looking towards the traditional media for that in-depth research. So the thing is, when you serve them news in a short format, if they're interested or they want to do more research, they know where to, to look to. And I know many people will get research from YouTube. Some of my friends who, even academics, we kind of get research. We do a lot of research on the platform like YouTube or they get information from trusted communities online that they belong to. So these are some of the audience strengths that should inform how we are producing news if we want to reach out to this critical mass in the news ecosystem. So, so we continue and this is like the, should I say the framework for the, I need, the ideal news experience. So what is the ideal news experience? What does it mean for, what does it look like for young people that are trying to consume information? Trusted source, so, you know, I want information from a source that I know and that I trust. And when you're talking about trust, I know building trust has been like the major issue that the news industry is trying to find solutions to because trust in news is declining. And, you know, even with fact-checking organizations, people will say, ask you, oh, if you're a fact-checking organization, who fact-check the fact-checker? So it's something that we are trying to do with. And one of the good ways to do that, or the ideal news experience for young people is, you know, they want to get the information from trusted sources. And if you ask me, I think it's the same for older, audience as well. They want to get their information from a source that they know. You know, they talk about credibility. When it's when it comes to credibility and trusted source, they want most people would prefer their information from people who have had the lived experience other than people who are just reporting on the experience. And this is why you see that influencers are quite like influencers have followers, especially maybe some influencers reporting on some niche topic. People would rather listen to, if you're in Nigerian in the Nigerian context, maybe like an Apoku doctor or like Dr. Zubo, than say get credible information from a fact check report. And because these are maybe some of the people that they know that, oh, they are engaged, they've lived through some of this experience or they want people who have, an, have had an experience rather than people who are just reporting on the experience. So this should tell us something about when we are preparing our information, the kind of sources that we engage, just try to ensure that you engage, you work with sources that have had the experience of the information you are trying to clarify so that you can connect more with people and they can trust that information. And so you have like affinity. Affinity relates also to the influencer culture where the next generation of news users wants to feel committed. I mean, they want to feel connected to the people that they think, you know, they share Shall I say similarities to, and they want to receive information from organizations that can cater to them or that understand their unique experiences. And this is why it's important when we talk about diversity and inclusion in a newsroom, you know, to ensure you have the you have male, you have female, you have young people, older people, so that the news that is being produced can cater for the experience of the people that you are trying to serve. 
and then transparency of intention. At this stage, I don't know if it's worth to ask if many of us, some of the platforms that we work for, do we disclose, like, maybe do we talk about conflicts of interest or people who fund the reporting that we do? I know in the, for like in the African media and landscape or the Nigerian media and landscape, media landscape that I'm quite familiar with, there's always an issue of, oh, the publisher's interest or ownership interest. But one of the ways that some fact-checking organization like Political Facts based in the US and some other credible organization have been able to get their audience to trust them is to be transparent about their intention, they are transparent about their funding sources because especially for young people, they want organizations and people to be transparent about maybe issues of conflict of interest, their agenda, their bias. And it's quite important that media organization, organizations should disclose people who fund them or people who are investing in the company so that people know like the interest that you are serving, that transparency is important. And the other thing in the framework is personal significance. The ideal news experience for young people is they want information that is significant to them and those that they care about. So you're looking at the topic, you're looking at actionability. And the topic is quite interesting because many people would usually focus on, on political news for many media organizations, even fact checking organization, maybe will focus on fact checking topics and policies. It was not until the COVID-19 pandemic that people started paying attention to topics like health. So to reach the to reach a critical audience, it's quite important to pay attention to important topics that are affecting your audience. I know here in the, U in the US, you have topics like abortion rights or reproduction, reproductive health rights is like a big issue that many people are concerned about. Maybe in other region you are looking at, okay, the audience you are trying to reach, what topic are they concerned about? Like what is the topic they really want to hear from for Nigeria now? Maybe we're talking about the cost of living and the impact of that on young people, unemployment, or even reproductive health issues. I know there are some health videos on TikTok. So if I'm doing fact check, I think I'll look into that. Some of the issues that young people are engaging with that they're trying to get clarity for. So that is some, one thing that we should do. We should always consider how we can adopt a broader definition of news that does not prioritize hard news over soft news. So there should be a balance and we should work with the preference of the audience that we are trying to reach or those that we are currently serving. Actionability, what can they do with information? that you are trying to render? What can they do with the fact check that you are trying to publish or the news analysis or the documentary that you are trying to produce? And this brings us to the important aspect of solution journalism. So it's not just about presenting the information. After presenting the information, tell them what they can do about it. Like, this is what you can do. You know, maybe share ideas or just share like few comments on, oh, maybe you're talking about how they can engage with their representative. This is what you can do, or you can get more information about this. Yeah. So the solution journalism approach, because now there's the news fatigue that people are tired of hearing sad news. Especially younger people, you know, not just grim and gloomy news. So why can why don't we approach our content production from the aspect of solution journalism? And there's this statistics that I found that 
the BBC World Service, they conducted a survey and the survey revealed that 64% of people under 35 wants the news to report solutions to problems. So there's the issue with climate change. What are the solutions? Election disinformation, AI and the rest. What are the solutions? How can people identify manipulated information. So also thinking of the solution approach is quite important in producing the idea, the ideal news experience for young people. And again, and then we go back to the fourth thing in the ideal news experience, which relates to desired storytelling. So you have someone saying, I want information presented in a way that works best for me. And this takes us back to the concept of design thinking that I mentioned earlier. Like how are your audience or the audiences consuming news? In what formats? What is the presentation? How do they engage with this content? And there's the keyword here, which is convenience. The generation of young news consumers, you know, they want news to be available on their preferred platforms. So now we are talking about podcasting on YouTube and they want it to be personalized and customize, customizable, like customizable to the things that they care about. You know, if they care about climate change or they care about like entertainment or some of the topic that are affecting them, education, employment opportunity or even migration opportunities. So how do you want to address that and package it in a convenient format? And the key to this is just thinking of how to present hard news. That is, if you deal with issues and policies and economy, present hard news in a format that is simple to assess and easy to digest. And that is why I believe to do this, sometimes you need to always think of inclusion and get the people who kind of understand this to be in charge of, to lead that news production. So, and we also have language when it comes to the aspect of desired storytelling. They want language that, that are simple, Later on in the course of the presentation, I'm going to share like some examples, some case studies, and we get to see people who produce hard news, like news relating to policies and diplomacy and the rest. And they use a format that is interesting that people can engage with. So we should not always have this impression that, oh, it's hard to cater to the younger generation or because you know people are getting their news on social media, they don't really have time to digest ad news. And I know this is something that I've seen in some of the legacy media that I even work with. You know, they do stories on the pages of newspapers, maybe like 3,000 words, 2,000 words, and they dump it on the website. And I'm like, who is going to read through this? Like who is going to spend 10 or 15 minutes reading through information on the topic. So we have to just look at, you know, how we package, how convenient we want to package. I'm talking about the language for people who are working on, working in non-English context. Language is important. Apart from producing information in English, and even if you're producing inform in information in English, you should use language that people or young generation of news users are able to relate with. And if we also want to cater to older audiences, which I think is also a critical part of the news ecosystem, you can think of producing content in local languages. For us at Fact Matter, regarding the election disinformation projects that I shared earlier, the content that we produce in collaboration with an outside influencer had lots of organic engagements. And you could, if you read through the comments, you could see like, oh, like there's a sincere longing to know. I believe local content, people are able to connect with, with readers 
there is this trust when you produce in local languages and you're able to get people that they respect in that cultural context. You know, it has to do with touching on their cultural nuances, and it helps to it, it helps to build more trust in the new system. And when it comes to accessible language, you should also look at humor. Humor is quite important. You know, get you can use that aspect some people use satire they use sarcasm just look at study your audience and know what would be important to them and easily accessible language and you can even use humor to sell ad news so these are some of the ways we should start looking at where if we want to reach like critical audiences online and one other thing that i would like to emphasize according to the desired storytelling aspects of the ideal news experience is the formats of information, the formats, how do we disseminate our news concepts, our news contents rather. I believe for some of, many of us, even those who write for say websites or radio and TV. Nowadays, I notice that even TV stations, they break down some aspect of their news and they post it on YouTube. So they break down certain aspects and they post it on YouTube because they are trying to engage people on that platform. So you, when we're talking about formats, the thing that really works, that has really proven to work is like the short videos, you know, short videos with stimulating multimedia formats that can allow audience to dive deep if they wish. So you can do a short video and have a link where they can get more information if they want to dive deep. And we can also try to copy the format of social media platforms. Like when you look at the user experience of social media platforms, maybe like Facebook and Instagram, you know, it's just about scrolling, scrolling and scrolling. So when you're pushing out your content, you are thinking of that. Maybe you just want to start with a graphic or a social media card that highlights the topic. And then you can, that summarizes the basic points of the information you are trying to push out. And then there's a link where they can reach out to get more information. So I think that is something that we really need to do. And that is something that the reports emphasize that we should try to mimic the format and user experience on like some of the social media apps and platforms used by younger people. So remember, if you have questions, we can still put it in the Q&A so that we can take it all together. I think it's good at this point. We spent like, okay, let me see. Oh, okay. I was thinking maybe we should take a break, but maybe we should get through this. We can just take like a five minute break to get water or coffee or something. So reaching critical audiences online, bearing in mind the thing that has been said about the ideal news experience what can you do differently these are just some of the action points that you can think of so for some of us it would need to involve partnering with independent creators who align with the mission with the mission of our news organization so partner with creators who align with the mission of your news organization. And usually this would be like content creators and influencers. I know people would have, people usually have reservations about using influencers, but from my experience, you can work with people who share the mission of your organization, people who are committed to the social good, there are different programs that are using influencers, even fast checking program or news organizations that are using influencers. It may be difficult to get people to work with you, but I think if you push on, you don't really need a large number, maybe just few influencers will align with your mission. They can work with you to kind of push your content and try to ensure that your content gets to reach a lot of young people. And also, I think the other thing is we need to encourage individual journalists within your organizations to create personal spaces 
that allow them to speak directly to their audience. I don't know if some people have reservation with this. So now there is a trend where even on Instagram, you know, Instagram is, I was reading a report on the New York Times the other time, and it talks about how Instagram is becoming a news platform. Like people are going to Instagram to consume information about politics, about news, about ad news. And you have some journalists, independent journalists who produce or curate conversations around the news or provide analysis on platforms like Instagram and on TikTok. There's a particular journalist, I can't remember the name now, who is, she's, a, she's an opinion writer with the Washington Post and she has a large following on TikTok and on Instagram. She even posts some of those videos on YouTube. So she will do analysis and post it on social media platform. Of course, it's a social media platform. She's not posting on the platform of the organization. So it's like a personal brand, but then they drive readers back to their organization. So it's something that I really encourage. If you have people within your news organization who are quiet, who know how, who have large follow, followers on social media, you can work with them. You can use that opportunity to ensure that they use that space to speak to your audience and they can always refer your audience back to your website. I think for like in Nigeria, for someone that I can, if, I, if I'm correct, maybe someone like a journalist like Fisai Oshoyombo, who is a popular investigative journalist, you know, who he has like a large Twitter follower. He has lots of followers on Twitter. So he's able to reach a lot of people on social media. He takes his social media brand, branding very seriously. And most times I know when he publish reports on his news platform, the application to that report is usually done on a social media platform. So that is an example of individual journalists within the organization working to create personal spaces that allow them to speak directly to their, to their audience. I know this would be like something that I would have been frowned at before now, but now that the news landscape is changing, it's quite important that this is like a factor that you can use to reach more audience, especially in today's news landscape. So the other thing that I would like to talk about when it comes to reaching critical audiences online is the need to enhance personalization and customized experiences. So usually the way to do this would be to kind of copy the algorithms of social media platforms, you know, the way it is with Facebook or YouTube, when you like a particular kind of content, you find out that you keep getting that the same type of content. Of course, I know there is an issue with that when it comes to creating echo chambers and the rest, but sometimes you find out that people have, they don't want to read, they are not interested in all the information that you're publishing. Maybe there is a certain aspect that they are most interested in. So you can put out a survey or if you're using an app, there's a way they can select the aspect of the news that they want. And then you can customize the kind of news that you push or that you amplify. So you can do that maybe through the newsletters that you send out or just using AI to kind of help with the, the algorithm to ensure that your followers get the kind of content that they want to engage with. And then I mentioned accessible language, experimenting with different tones. So use humor to engage with hard news, curate live conversations. I mentioned that, you know, on X spaces, on Instagram live, just find a way to make the news interesting. Like even if you are doing videos, provide analysis, there's a way where you can use like a soft tone to talk about ad news. Okay, so at this point, uh oh, 
So Paul, I don't know. I do we want to take a break? I don't know if it, I think it's kind of hard to just let people go on for like <laughs> two hours yeah. without. Uh, so what do you think? I would advise we focus on using this time to answer the questions that we already have. We have lots of questions. So probably that would be like a break for okay. if people want to, anybody wants to quickly get something while we deal with the questions and answers. So if you want to ask your question live, please raise your hand. If you are raising your hand, but you don't want to talk, please lower your hand while I do you with the ones that have been typed please raise your hand if you'd like to ask your questions live so let me take some questions um so we have already um have you you while looking at it i think we have people that are raising their hands so let me see how many we can take live I mean, have questions okay. Do we take. have a time frame for this oh, yes. segment? Like for the yeah. How many do you still have more slides? Lots of slides. Are you done with the slides? I'm not done with the slides. I have a few case studies, but let me just ah. quickly Okay, let, okay. While you are doing that, let, let's take one. Ajibala Mzat. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much, yes. uh, Anna. Can you hear me, Hannah? Yes. yes, I can. Yeah, Hannah, well done. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us uh, and, and the work that you have been doing uh, over a period of time. Thank you. So I just want to hear how you are also thinking about, because I, I you spoke so much about what the newsroom, news organization needs to do to have more, to collect more audience and to encourage more engagement with our audience and all that. But beyond getting engagement um, from the audience, how, how do you translate some of these engagement to money? Because that has always been the issue for those of us who are in this space. Yes, you try all the tricks in the book. You use social media tools, you use uh, AI tools, you try to design your stories in different ways. You do all kinds of things so that you can have more traffic uh, on your website. But at the end of the day, this does not uh, translate to something very significant. I mean, the, the budget of a newsroom compared to one individual running a platform uh, is different. One man newsroom, you don't need to spend so much. You just spend on yourself and a few things that you are spending money on. But for news organizations that have a workforce, how do you translate all these uh, strategies of uh, getting engagement into profits? I want to know how you are thinking about this uh, challenge. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you okay. quickly answer that? that? So I'll quickly answer that. Thank you so much, Mr. Ajibola, for joining and for the question you know the thing about translating engagement into money it's quite funny i think we can have that would be like another dedicated session to talk about monetizing content for a news platform but one thing that i would like to say that even in developed economics they are realizing like journalism would have to survive maybe especially through grants and donation that is something that that is a viable thing. But what I would like to say when it comes to translating engagement into money is to look at the model that some of the influencers use. So usually they will have sponsored posts, like people would sponsor the video. Like one of the case that I'm going to show is like a guy who produces like news in the UK and most of the videos are sponsored by like some tech companies or organizations. So if we are able to build our brand to the stage where, let's say we have lots of followers on social media platforms and organizations or marketing or digital marketers know that, oh, we are reaching a particular aspect of people, then they can use that opportunity to advertise on 
a platform like the New York Times, apart from having like a successful subscription model, which is not something that happens in other regions of the world. Like I know in my country, Nigeria, people usually don't have the culture of paying for news. So that cannot work. But then you see some of their newsletters, you see sponsored posts. And I know they get like, there's an ad for revenue from that. Because the way social media is designed, um, you know, it's not designed for, especially for journalists, it's not designed for journalists to kind of make money. But if you are approaching our content from how the content creators make money, because they do make a lot of money. They make money on YouTube. I don't know how much they make on Facebook, but there's a monetization aspect. So if you're approaching our content production from that, that is something, that is a way like, a way to kind of make money. But, and the truth is, it's quite sad that you have like a new, a big news organization, but you know, maybe it's just like some few people would be able to key into that because if you're making money from content, maybe you're producing content that a lot of people really like. So you have to look for a niche content that people can engage with. And okay. quickly, I need to add, there's something that I need to add that this is, this is a journey, this is a process. You start and you keep growing and building and growing and building. So you keep growing, you get more people and then you can start seeing opportunities for monetization. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Arpan, you have the floor. Can you quickly ask a question before we go to the last lap? Hello, can you hear us? Kamran, can you speak? Okay. Uh, hello, hello, hello? Yes, yes. Hello, we can hear you. Uh, greetings from Pakistan. Okay. Such an insightful uh, session. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Hannah. I have a uh, question. Uh, earlier, uh, I want to ask, but unfortunately, uh, I couldn't reach you. So, can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can hear you. Uh, what is the... Uh, Hello. Yeah, you can go on camera. Uh, uh, I want to uh, please uh, enlighten the the misinformation and disinformations. So I would be grateful if you could enlighten uh, this issue as well. Okay. Hello. Okay, so I like issues yeah. with disinformation and misinformation. Yes. In what aspects? Or do you want her to distinguish between the two? Is that your question, Cameron? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, I think so. Disinformation is news that is shared with intention to deceive. And misinformation is news that is shared without. Usually there's no intention to deceive, maybe shared unknowingly by people who are just concerned about sharing passing out information that they feel would be useful. So the difference between both is just intent. With disinformation, it is, it is intentional, it is planned. With misinformation, it is unintentional and it is not planned. So I think that is a simple answer to that question. Thank you very much. Straight away, Gwazda, the last live question we can take. Oh. Thank you. Good evening, the host and the panelists. I must appreciate your time. Now, having said that, I want to permit me to reference the first contributor from with the panelists. I think Ajiba, the names. Sorry, Mr. Me Ajiba Lamsats. Yeah. Ajiba, yes. He he was making mention of monetization as in monetizing news and trying to make money from all of the the stuff now that is where we have gotten a trunk and as journalists and then we've now allowed some persons take a uh, who 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 researched about journalism and then brought in an angle because as a journalist who is 
all encompassing you are into advertising marketing and other other related activities it therefore means that you have the viral and the paper to generate content in such a way that you will have mass followership and from that end you will have that money in which you've been looking for now let me break it down a little We are struggling to hear Gaza. We are, um, okay, Anna, let's continue. We'll be back with Gaza, uh, Gaza, uh, when the audio, uh, yeah, or maybe yeah. it can it can type the question in the chat, yes. so yes, we are able to you know just move on. So, I'm gonna try to try and see we'll move on fast because I really, I really like to to take to answer some of the questions that we have. So I'll go back to, okay, just, just a second. Make sure that I have the right screen up. So while Hannah is doing that, I want to encourage everybody that is not part of our forum. I know people are asking for the slides. If I get Hannah to share the slides, uh, we'll be sharing it in our forum. So. I want you to go to the chat box and click the link in the chat box right now to join our Facebook forum. That is where um, we'll be sharing more insights and we can continue this conversation. So the link is in the chat box right now. It takes you to the Facebook forum. Are you ready, Anna? Yes, I am. Yeah, over to you. Okay, so talking about case studies and so this is the LDR news which, you know, I kind of discovered in the reports, you know, hearing about this, that platform in the, for the first time. So it's like an independent journalist, it's a team, and I suspect it's a very small team. So basically what CLDR News does is to make news accessible to younger people and they push up news in, video formats on YouTube. You know, they push out their videos on YouTube. They have YouTube shots. So if you have, if you just want the very short version, it's available on YouTube. Then maybe some of the longer version of the videos, which is usually like nine minutes. I think the longest I've seen is, is 30 minutes. So, and one thing that I like about this is, you know, trying to make ad news, present ad news to, to young people. And if you can see his quotes here, talking about placing great amounts of emphasis on topics that are interesting and also investing time to ensure branding. Branding is key. I think one of the key team members that we will need going forward if you if we want to reach critical younger audience is to you know maybe like a good graphics person or a video editor so that people can engage more with the content so this is an independent media group focusing on making digital content it started in the uk and now they've grown to have more channels you have the tldr news the global one there is a channel catering to the eu there's a global channel so it's growing and they have two points, more than 2.5 million subscribers and majority are age 16 to 35. So this is kind of late credence to what we say about young people getting their news from platforms other than maybe websites and the rest. So what I, I want to do is just to quickly show, let me see if I can get through this link, okay. To quickly show how the TLDR news. I hope you guys can still see my screen. Yes. Okay. So you see, this is the website, just the about, and if you see some of like their videos. And these are the channels, their YouTube channel. So they basically reach out to people on, on YouTube. 
they have a UK channel, a global audience, they have business. And you know, it's incredible because they are working on launching a newspaper, which is quite ironic because we're saying, oh, print is no longer in business, but they are working on launching a newspaper. And I also know that one of the things for that newspaper is like, you have to subscribe and they print and they send it to you. So this just tells you that there's a unique angle. If you use like a unique angle, you use a unique approach, people will get to you. And they also have a safe podcast. I just want to, maybe let's see if we can click on this video. This video is brought to you by Nebula. When Rishi Sunak came in. So this is what I mentioned about, you know, getting the monetization aspects. So you get like organizations to sponsor each video. Of course, they don't have any editorial oversight over the content you are pushing out, but it's just like advertising. So advertising would have to look towards like the digital platforms, not just like the traditional marketers who work in newsrooms. Into office, he made fixing the economy his number one priority. In amongst stopping the boats and cutting NHS waiting lists, Sunak also pledged to halve inflation, grow the economy and cut national debt as part of his so-called five priorities. The months between now and then haven't exactly been the best for Sunak here. Inflation remains stubbornly high. Government debt isn't falling, it's rising. And data published by the Office for National Statistics had put the economy 1.2% below its pre-pandemic size at the end of 2021, which would have placed the UK at the very bottom of the G7 in terms of post-pandemic recovery. However, in a rare bit of good news for the UK, a few days ago, the ONS revised its figures to say that the UK economy was actually GDP. However, late last week, the ONS announced at the moment. So, from your favourite creators. In fact, if you sign up using our link, then a third of that money goes straight to us. Now, that's not all either. While the economy is a problem for most countries around the world at the moment, while they're living in the midst of a cost of living crisis, there's also the matter of the global fertility crisis, which we actually discussed in the daily discussion. There, Rory and Zach sat down and discussed the intricacies of the fertility crisis to help us better understand what's really going on. In fact, we release these daily discussions, <laughs> well, daily, covering a huge variety of topics in a more analytical and detailed way than is possible in these main videos. The entire series is available exclusively on our streaming service, Nebula. If you've been thinking about signing up, then I have some good news. For a limited time, we're offering lifetime memberships. Yep. Okay, so I think I had to kind of fast forward because of the time. So I think something that we you should notice from that, some of the videos that I watch should have like, say, oh, this video is brought to you by Brilliance. Usually they are sponsored by some of those tech companies. And this point too, you could see like the graphics, you could see like the conversation as time. I know the podcasting conversation as that is quite, is the in thing now, even for, I know even on YouTube in Nigeria, it's something that celebrities and content creators are using. And some of those podcast video cutouts would make it to social media platforms and it's quite popular and people will be forced to go back to watch the full episode on YouTube. So that is something also that we can use to approach news, to simple, uh, news this, uh, like trying to get news to reach new audiences and one way to also consider monetization. So using like the influencers approach, the digital marketing ecosystem is quite different. So that provides like an opportunity for, for monetizing our content so i'll continue with the with the case studies and this time around i don't know if people from india are quite if you have anyone from india maybe you could they are familiar with InShots, and this is a news app which provides news summaries and 60 words 
So it's just sister words, short form, like one paragraph for you to engage with. Then if you want to dive deeper, it takes you directly to the link of the news publisher. So there's an option for you to get your news on the go. Then if you're interested, you can click on a link and you have like more sufficient information. So that is something I don't know if any of us here are thinking of, you know, developing a news app. Some media organizations will have like a news app. So you can start thinking of maybe having a session where people have the option of getting short news and then they have the opportunity to dive deep if they want. So I'm highlighting a fact checking organization here, Dubawa, and I noticed something that they've been doing recently, which is using talking head, talking head videos to kind of talk about fact checking. I would have loved to play this, but I know because of, maybe because of the time, I want us to be able to take the questions. And if you click on this video, you'll see where like the fact checker is talking about basically debunking a, a myth about chocolate. And, you know, they try to insert some, I don't know how to describe it. You know, they try to insert some funny clips. So it's, it's kind of funny. You have the funny aspects. Let me quickly see if I can play this so we have a better understanding of what we're talking about. that are high in calories and sugar hence should be consumed less or avoided. But what if there's more? According to the claimant, Dark chocolate contains flavonol, which increases stem cell production and is anti-inflammatory. We found several studies to support these claims, but there's a need to tread with caution. While these studies agree these benefits are associated with dark chocolates, these studies agree there is need for more research to establish these findings because it is important to know the measure of flavonol that is beneficial and if the benefits outweighs the downside. See you guys in our next video. Hello guys. Are you a lover of chocolates? If you are, you get it. Come closer. I've got great news for you. Let's watch this video. An Instagram user claims dark chocolates are beneficial to the heart. So I think we can see that, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's very relatable. I think it's quite commendable that Dubawa is doing this. It's a good approach that I would also recommend for if you are doing fact checking. So just for context, Dubawa is a fact checking organization in Nigeria. They have chapters in West Africa. And if we are honest, fact checking content is one of the, should I say, hardest content to push out to people because many would find it boring. But using this approach where, okay, so the fact checker is talking on a, you know, posting a video on Instagram. Then they try to kind of infuse some humor into it. You could see some, we like, I can't call it B-roll, like some extracts that are inserted into that video clips kind of make it interesting. And for news, for young people in Nigeria, that is relatable because it's a trend that is seeing contents that are produced by, by social media influencers. Okay, sorry, let me just go back to presenting my slide. Apologies for the glitch. Okay, so I've talked about Dubawa and there's something that I'll quickly mention and that is like an opportunity for audience engagement on encrypted messaging apps. That is something that I'm working on presently at the moment. I don't know if many of us are considering turning to disseminating information or reaching audiences on encrypted messaging app. I know some news organization already do that where they have WhatsApp groups and the rest. But now there's an option of getting people on channels, you know, what WhatsApp channels, 
and some news platform have as much as you know they have millions of millions of followers i just typed this into my this photo is from my whatsapp channel i was trying to search and you can see legit ng this is an outer news platform it's a news platform that also produces in outside language in nigeria and you can see the number of followers the bloomberg news like two million followers and i've seen some other nigerian platform like pulse and they have like two million followers already on channels and the thing with channel is you are sharing the stories and the link can take your readers back to the website back to your website and that is something that other traditional social media platform like Facebook or Twitter or even Google search are cutting back on. So this is, if you ask me, this is also another platform to look into if you're trying to reach audiences, you know, explore WhatsApp channel. You have prominent news publishers doing that, or you can continue to explore publishing on WhatsApp group. I want to run fast. So Identify opportunities. One thing that I'd like us to take away from here, if we have time, I'm not sure we have time, I would have said we could just try it out. Identify opportunities. What do you want to try? What do you want to try? What formats do you want to try? What engagement means do you want to try? What do you want to change? Like looking at how you've been connecting with your audience, looking at how you've been producing news, what would you be changing? And then what do you want to stop doing? Maybe you want to stop posting on websites without thinking of, you know, engagement on social media or on messaging platforms or without considering or using ad language. So these are prompts that we can use to identify opportunities. What do you want to try? What do you want to change? What do you want to stop? I'm running now. So these are the resources. I, I don't know if the slides will be made available. If not, I can post this on. Yeah, we we just... would like to share the slide. So immediately yes. you share with me, I'm going to pass it on to our attendees. I'm going to share it uh, in our Facebook forum, which I know some people have already joined, have approved their request but if you've not joined that facebook forum i'm putting the link again in the chat we don't send on whatsapp i'm sorry <laughs> so please okay. just go to that link and uh, i will endeavor that you get it so are we ready for the very last dash yes, question and the answers? last yes. one so that we can ask questions <laughs> yes uh thank you very much thank you thank you very much i think um so which has answered many questions people have. So somebody, let's start from the tools question. Betsy would like to know whether the Lumen 5 you suggested is a paid or whether there is a free version. Yeah, in Lumen 5, you have a free version, you have a paid version. The paid version allows you to do more things like, and you, you can put your own watermark, you can brand it according to, your news organization brand style, but for the free version, you have to use their work, their watermark. Okay, thank you very much. Mohammed is going the way of Hey Hi. Do you have any suggestions regarding using Hey Hi for audience engagement? Yes, you know, the thing with AI, there are some AI tools that you can use to craft better headlines. And maybe if you are using like, like Microsoft Pilot or ChatGPT, like you can use it to brainstorm on some of the ideas that you have. And I believe AI is one of the things that you can use to kind of enhance how you package your information. Journalists, we don't like to think that way, but that is one reality. It's a, it's a, it's a trend that we are still learning about. So you could look through that, you could look into that. It's, it's very promising for reaching new Thank audiences. You very yeah, thank you. Can Danny would like to know? Uh, I have um, there are some influencers who are partisan. Not only that, but they are also occasionally engaging in heavily misleading information and propaganda, knowingly or unknowingly. Yet they have an asset, asset which is mass following that you don't have. How do you deal with influencers that have massive followership and uh, you still dispelling misinformation? 
Yes, I think the thing is maybe reaching out to them to let them know. And one other thing that you should look out for if you're engaging influencers is you should engage people who can who are willing to admit to their error and correct their mistakes. You know, they are human beings, like they don't have the training of a journalist. So sometimes they act on their impulses or emotion. But work with people that when you notify them that, oh, what you're peddling with this information, they are able to either delete that post or just tell their followers that, oh, I got this wrong. And they can point their followers to, to credible okay. options. Thank you very much. Rabbi is asking questions about uh, the fact that since we know we need to go well against this, uh, but how do you see the challenge of media organizations and journalism's over dependence on social media to reach and grow audience? The thing is, you know, the thing about the over dependence on social media, I'm not sure it's something that journalists have power over, you know, with the tech platform and everything. Now, chat GPT is in the mix. I mean, AI is in the mix, so that is another issue. So it's not something that we have like control over, but the way is to look for a way where we are still able to set the agenda, create the conversations and maybe look for a strategy to monetize our content even outside of social media. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have Louis from Manila, Philippines. What is your take on balancing sense through digital discourse while also struggling in sifting people or content creators who tend to sound and appear like experts but are actually not? It's a reality, especially since platforms are open and free to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like... The thing about you know balancing and uh, when you look at the fact the sad aspect that people are no longer trusting institutions so they would rather trust like someone that they know on platform and i think this still goes down to maybe when we get trusted information from the experts we can present this information in ways that are relatable to the people that we are trying to reach Maybe we could like use an humorous tone or use good branding that's when you push it on YouTube, people are still able to, you know, to engage. The case study that I showed, the news platform, the YouTube news platform, if you follow his channel, the guy interview, like he interviews politicians, like experts and the rest, but you see the mode of presentation, he's still able to get to reach people like young people we're still able to use that format of an influencer so basically pushing out credible information from institutions using relatable formats that people are able to engage with i think yeah that would be my yeah. response to that question bernard you have the floor bernard are you there you have the mic bernard we are waiting for you okay uh okay i'm standing through okay and that's it we'd like to know how do we use our skills to engage um uh okay no i don't think it's directly probably and that's it you like i think you should recast that image okay uh amzat is talking about aligning where you are getting your sponsorship for the sponsored content Aligning it with um, probably your editorial beliefs and perspectives. So do you have any concerns or guidance regarding what you should be on the lookout for while getting or seeking out sponsors for content? Yeah, I think the thing is like to seek out sponsors who don't have, basically it's felt out. They don't have like any, there's no conflict of interest. They don't have, they cannot determine the contents that you push out. They don't have any say in your editorial guideline and editorial policy. And this should mean you can, this also means that you can't take advert from anybody, from just any news organization, because you have to look at the values that you are preaching. Okay, let's say maybe you, you are a news organization, you, you take sponsored advert from a bank. You can't take sponsored advert from 
let's say like a scamming scheme or some of this networking thing that are not really approved by the government. So you can't mislead your audience in the name of getting sponsorship. Or let's say you are trying, you are getting sponsorship for like a health product that has not been, that is not being regulated by the government, that is not certified by the government. So you should be able to draw a line. Thank you. And um, probably for this session, uh, Bernard, you still have the floor if you want to talk. Um, so how can we tell our message to resonate with the specific interests and values of our critical audience? Okay, so tailoring your message to resonate with the specific interests and values of our critical audience. So it depends on who you are trying to reach in the first place. Let's say, and that is why I advocate, you know, using a design thinking process, finding out from the people that you are trying to reach. Like if you are trying to reach older audience, for example, maybe like people like parents, and you are reaching them through social media, you are not using like a traditional means like radio. So like WhatsApp will be a good place for you to focus on. So you're looking at what format can go on WhatsApp. Is it the audio? Is it short videos? So that will be my response to okay, tailoring your message and to resonate with the specific audience interest. Okay, so you want to reach out to maybe upward mobile young people, you are looking at, okay, let's use podcasts. They are most likely to listen to a podcast than an older person that usually rely on WhatsApp for news and information. So you go to where your audience is and just research where they are getting their news information then you can design your content to reach them. So if you're doing videos, audio, or whatever, it should be informed by where they get their information from. But there's also this interesting question around uh, responding to criticism uh, in fact-checking. So do you have experience around this criticism and um, handling criticism um, in this space of um, uh, empowering the truth? Yeah, I think, you know, usually the the question that describes, oh, is it the question or the quote that is quite popular is, oh, who fact, who fact check the fact checker? So basically responding to criticism, when you face criticism, like as a fact checker, of course, the best way is, you know, to to try to prevent. And that is why transparency is key. Um you know, getting affiliated with organizations such as IFCN, but my organization is not IFCN certified yet, but we work with partners that are certified by IFCN. And I can't really think of maybe a time when some of our organization, when they've gotten anything wrong, some of the news contents that we work with our partners, but there have been time where they'll say, oh, you guys are being partisan, you are focusing on this candidate. And what we did at that time was to do like a live chat to explain. So explaining and engaging to your audience is a way to maybe respond to some of the criticism if you are criticized for maybe like being partisan, focusing on one can candidate or not providing a particular data to back up your plan. Try to explain explain your process, be transparent with your process. If there's a space where you are wrong, admit it. And I think that would be my response to that question. Thank you. So I think I've selected the two last questions. So what do you think the metrics of KPI should be uh, when tracking and attempting to measure the effectiveness of reports? I have, you know, from uh, I am relating with colleagues who believe, you know, the normal yardstick of, oh, how many people read this as measuring the impact for a new story is bullshit, like that should be half of it. But I think in metrics, of course, you want to look at the number of views, but there are times where even the number of views is not as important as the time people spend on that engagement. So maybe you could look at like comments. What are the type of comments that people are making? Do they find it helpful? And I know it's quite difficult for like a platform, if you publish your news on a platform like WhatsApp, because you can't really measure, you know, it tends to end in encryption, but sometimes you can look at the emoji, like what are the emojis that people are posting, their reaction. 
So that can help you measure the impact. I believe metrics should not, we should not be me measuring the impact of our reports based on metrics, the number of views, the, you know, those are not really something that we should be looking at. Of course, they would count because you want to keep making progress. You want to know what you can do better, but that should not be the only focus. Sometimes let's look at the reaction and the comments that we get from people who engage with the post. Idrissa, you have the floor. Yes, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, this is Idrissa Jerry from Sierra Leone. And the reason they posing such questions, uh, I was actually working on fact checking because the 2023 election, I was working with iVerify. I mentioned it in the last session. So these questions I raise are questions are like challenges we were facing. Sometimes we want to measure, like the question that has to do with the, the metrics and the, the, the KPIs has to do with our uh, measurable. What do we get right? What were the things that we did not get right? We were able to do these measurables to know how successful, fa because fact checking in Sierra Leone is something new. People find it very boring to read fact checking content, but when it involves politics, governance, and maybe the ruling government and opposition that has to do with politics, it becomes more interesting. When it has to do with a popular artist or a popular art with a different craft that people love, they, they will tend to listen more. So what am I raising here is Sierra Leone is new when it comes to fact checking. So some of these things are really helpful. I, I found it very, very, very helpful. And especially where she mentioned around, we should not be mentioning our metrics around views, around, uh, mm -hmm. around uh, maybe, yes, what she was saying. However, okay. I love our submission. Our submission is in place. I love it so much. Okay. I think Thank that's you very much. We'll go to Moses. Yeah, thank Moses, you. you have the floor. Moses. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I'm sorry I've been on and off, but uh, I attended the first, the beginning of the session and then the last one. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the presenter. Uh, um, I'm Jimmy Moses from South Sudan. I'm a fact checker. So I appreciated your element of uh, using videos in fact checking because uh, we have never done it and it's so nice. I don't know whether we can collaborate and you take us through uh, how we can also adopt it in, in South Sudan. And then secondly, it will be something like a question or um, we always find difficulties in bringing about uh, the female gender or ladies on board, even in our team and then in, uh, in our trainings, because we have some training. So you being a female uh, working in, in this industry, what has been your experience? Uh, and uh, what can we like, what can I learn from you as? Oh, okay, okay. Anna? Okay. Yes, I'll quickly respond to that. So. Relating to, you know, the video fact checking, you can reach out to me. I can maybe later, if I have time in the coming days, we can, I can walk you through, like maybe if you want to use Lumen 5 or you want to use other tools like Adobe or so. The difficulty with the gender aspects, you know, it's important. To, I mean, inclusion is important. So you have to be deliberate. I know sometimes it's even difficult to get women sources. But you can start, maybe bring them in from the universities. They can start as intern. Just be more in, intentional about reaching out to women journalists or even students who want to practice journalism. I started as a student writer, so that was a good aspect for me. So you can look towards maybe going to the universities, women who are studying journalism, and you could offer internship. That way you can get them to stay in the newsroom. Okay, thank you very much. So before we wrap it up, I would like to know what do you think, um, in summary, the take-home message from this session would be, if you are in the audience, uh, Anna, and you think uh, this is what everybody should take home today, what do you think that would be from you? Yeah, I think the thing to take home is to think 
differently? Like, how do you want to approach how you reach your audience? How do you want to approach how you reach your audience? The design thinking, like the prompts that I have in the slides that I thought maybe would have time to, you know, what do you need to change? What do you need to stop doing? What do you need to start doing? So that would be like my key take, like my key take home. What do you need to start doing? What do you need to stop doing? What do you need to change? And reaching out in like the content strategy that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hannah, as always. Uh, great uh, session. Uh, thanks for your experience. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for always uh, accepting our invitation every time we invite you. And um, I hope I look forward to receiving the emails and I will gladly share it in the Facebook forum. So if you've not shared your, if you've not joined our Facebook forum, I encourage you to join. I've put the link up again. And um, yeah, so thank you to everybody that have attended from across the world. Immediately the session ends, uh, a survey is going to pop up on your screen and um, we are going to expect you to fill it. And um, we hope um, that we can really, really continue this conversation. We are going to resume the session next week again, and we have a lot of interesting sessions. And I can't wait to see all the ideas you are hoping to submit for the grant application. So on behalf of the Minter, uh, I said very good community. I said thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us today. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Stay in touch. Thank you. See? Thank you for Look being at, engaging. Thank you for the engaging audience. Look at all audience. the emojis. All the emojis. Come <laughs> on. <I'm... laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Goodbye, wow. everyone. I don't want to end this. I'm seeing all these emojis. I don't. I wait till everybody's tired of sending emojis, then I'll end it. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm to run along. <laughs> <laughs>